Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of News from a World in Flux. I'm Dr. Charlie Gardner, I'm a conservation scientist with Scientists for Extinction Rebellion and I'm with... Claire Farrell, I'm one of the co-founders of XR. And in this show we try to chat about some of the recent uh, climate related news that hasn't been sufficiently covered in the mainstream press and try to draw out some of the key findings of that. And to t in today's episode, we want to talk about some recent research looking at the economic costs of climate change and the destruction of nature. And also talk about the really exciting Restore Nature Now March, which is taking place on 22nd of June. But before we go into that, there have been a lot of um, legal updates on um, cases and other legal issues to do with climate activism in the UK since our last episode. So I wonder, Claire, if you could update us on some of what's been happening. Yeah, sure. A very dear person uh, in our movement, Trudy Warner, who um, we've talked about quite a lot in the past, who uh, was... She started a lone protest, basically, outside a court to uh, protest for um, juries to be able to hear the reasoning behind climate activists' actions, um, particularly in a Crown Court uh, with a judge called Silas Reid, who was very uh, restrictive on the capacity of defendants to explain themselves and said, you know, I'll, I'll jail you if you um, talk about climate change or if you talk about... Um, fuel poverty in the process of this trial because I've decided that it's not relevant and actually some people have served custodial time for uh, ignoring his directions and saying things to the jury that he said were off limits. Um, Trudy started holding these signs outside the court saying you know juries have a, a right to their uh, conscience to act on their conscience and not uh, be completely um, beholden to the directions of a judge and this is a um, concept of jury um, independence which goes back to the 1600s. She was being tried by um, a case that was brought against her by the Attorney General or the Solicitor General so really this came from the government from the from the heart of the state to say we want to prosecute you Trudy Warner for highlighting an inalienable right which is held by every juror in this country and has and is hundreds of years old and is the basis of the reason why juries can be the seen as the backstop in our constitutional design against tyranny or the potential of a of a tyrannical state for reminding people of that right which by the way you will never be reminded of as a juror, you never get a judge who says, by the way, you can ignore me if you feel like it. If, it's, if, that, if your conscience says this feels wrong, you are at liberties to ignore me. They never do that. You know, the, the, the government said letting people know they have that right is a, is a completely unreasonable thing to do. And actually, we think that you're either in contempt of court or at worst, you're um, perverting the course of justice, um, which is an immense crime. I mean, let's be serious. Like this, she she was a, she was originally um, arrested with the suggestion that she may face um, a charge that can carry, I think, a life <laughs> imprisonment sentence. Right. So, for sitting there holding a little piece of paper um, on the floor, and that trial played out, and the um, the judges in the royal, I think it was in the royal courts of justice said she hasn't broken the law. Now. Um, to me, that's it, you know interesting, partly because you know we don't often see these things get sort of escalated up the judicial system and then play in favour of protesters. Certainly, the direction of travel is the opposite to that recently. But also because there was a very interesting point that was made by the judge, which was words to the effect of. And if the Solicitor General doesn't like the fact that this is the law, perhaps they should address that in Parliament, where laws are actually addressed. So, of course, um, we all go, yay, Trudy, <laughs> very happy about that. But what's um, also then happened is um, an appeal has been launched against that. So, presumably, yeah, so, you know, don't like the result, spin the wheel again, let's try again. So. Let's, yeah, watch this space. It's um, presumably going to go now into the Supreme Court and we'll see what they make of it. And there have been other cases 
recently which which highlight just why the government are so unhappy with jurors having this right and jurors mm. being able to to acquit people. So tell us about that Just Stop Oil case. Yeah, some people who in Just Stop Oil who um, went to the, the source, if you like, of the carbon emissions, the fossil fuel distribution at petrol stations. You may remember quite a long time ago, there was a series of actions where young people particularly went to petrol stations and laid down on the forecourts and spray painted um, and used these kind of emergency um, hammers, like the kind that you would get out of a, um, on a train to break yeah, the windows right. to escape, like those kind of small hammers. And they hammered the um, displays on these petrol pumps so that they would sort of decommission them or stop them from working, therefore stopping the flow of petrol or diesel, therefore stopping the flow of the thing that causes the emissions, which is always said to um, disruptive activists, you know, why don't you go and disrupt like the people that do the damage or, you know, where the emissions come from? So this is one of the things that they did, not just because people complain in that way, but it, you know, it does chime with that. So they went and did those actions and um, they were charged with criminal damage. They went into a court where a judge said, you have no defense in law. So basically, you can, if you have no defence as deemed by a judge, you can be given very little room to manoeuvre in front of the jury, depending who the judge is and how they then decide to handle the case and uh, manage the room. But a group of uh, 12 jurors have um, unanimously acquitted them, even though it was said that this is something that they ca- they cannot defend in British law. So in in, in this case, and in other cases where these things happen, it's called a perverse verdict, which is also funny that, you know, using this inalienable right that's very important in terms of making sure that it's a democratic system that doesn't have, like, state control baked into it, the freedom of the jury, should they choose to use it, um, is called a perverse verdict because the judge will have said to them, and this is how it works, you get like a flow chart of procedures to go through as a, as a group. So you would say, well, if you have a certain defense, if this, then go here, or if no, go here. If this, then this, and often it's laid out for, for people in stages. So in order uh, to find people not guilty on the basis of having no legal defense, there will have been um, presumably very limited or no direction at all that leads the jurors to a not guilty verdict. Everything they've been instructed to do will probably lead them to a guilty verdict. So it's interesting that even in the current sort of um, climate, haha, if you want to call it that, there's a, still a decent dose of people in the in the general public who can be chosen at random who will say, well, on balance, I want to acquit these people, despite the fact I've been told that I probably shouldn't shows you how strongly held their convictions must have been to step away from the instructions they were given and to take this you know this, this mm. step which they might not even really it wasn't made clear that 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 step was even yeah. available to them and yet they still took it yeah. which is fantastic the thing that that relates to is um you know that report that came from john woodcock lord walney which um also as a sort of furthering of the work in this kind of um, clamp down on people's civil liberties and the right to protest, the right to free speech, I think, free association, is uh, baked into that report that he put into the Home Office last year is also something that says, you know, they, the government needs to find mechanisms to deal with juries who will not convict, who decide to acquit on the, on, on the basis of their conscience because the evidence shows you know, that the person was there and they did hammer the thing or they were there and they did throw the paint or they did whatever. So it's also, it's part of a, in the context of what's happening and what we know people have been, sort of people in the political establishment have been very worried about, you know, this particular issue of jury equity is, I think, is going to continue to come under like a lot of scrutiny. So just to clarify, this report is, so so Walney is the government's, independent advisor on um, extremism and political violence 
Is that right? A political violence and disruption is his title. It's interesting, I only just found out recently-ish that um, that job title wasn't something that came out of nowhere. It was an adaptation from a role that used to be something like the, the UK envoy on violent terrorism. So it's a repackaging of that job to deal with terrorism to be a job that is designed to, um, in my opinion, conflate disruption and violence into one package, which I think we've kind of discussed before. But he did a sort of call for public submissions and then invited a bunch of us to go speak to him. I think we've talked about this quite recently, but um, importantly, through cast the sort of invitation out to the general public and said if you want to make a submission what you think about political violence and disruption we're um, asking people to submit their thoughts and feelings the report that's resulted from that has taken three years to produce went into the home office around christmas time and then some of it was drip fed out into the media in the earlier part of this year and then eventually the the paper gets sort of officially published on House of Lords paper, um, at which point he is really, for me, interestingly, taking the um, focus massively away from what you do or what you've done, which is the um, usual way that you would judge um, a protest group or you know a, a group who are lobbying or pressuring or a civil society group, but re- rather focusing on what you think. This is, for me, very important. It's a shift in the work from what have you done and what are you willing to do, what kinds of things do you do, to what do you think about. To me, this is very concerning because it's baked into that report, for example, is a claim that says incels, for example, from the internet, men who sit on the internet and then sometimes go out and commit violent acts, may be dangerous on an individual basis, but they're not that dangerous because they don't have a coherent ideology behind them. So it's really saying the people who are, do have coherent beliefs and ideologies, which by the way, they've decided what they are and put them onto you. So his beliefs about Extinction Rebellion when we met were all rooted in the foundations of policy exchange Mm. 2019 report about us and it seems they've not changed you know their view is um that people like extinction rebellion um particularly the radical end of the peace movement people that are like palestine action particularly people who are um part of this moment of solidarity and protest in you know support of um Palestine and um, the people of Gaza, uh, you're seeing a sort of dual track attack on the groups that are really focused on those two issues, climate and environment and Palestine. But interestingly, what they're really trying to do is get underneath the sort of um, the skin of the, of the so-called beliefs of these groups, the ideologies of these groups, and then declare that those ideologies are dangerous. And of course, this comes quite soon off the back of a conversation which I think probably must have been bollocks, but I just don't know, that said, you know, we actually think we're going to put socialism as a sort of um, topic on prevent, you know. So it's like you can't talk about it in schools because it's like a doctrine that's associated with things that are dangerous and stuff. So, I mean, what this is, what this ultimately about is pushing the boundaries of how much you can restrict people's freedom of thought um, expression, education, critical inquiry, and put uh, political thinking that doesn't align itself with neoliberal capitalism um, off limits, basically, and declare that if you're interested in any of these things, you're dangerous. Of course, there's a sort of um, what he is very vexed about, I guess, is this idea of the sort of extreme left, which historically you may think you know, often sort of ends up being like really communist kind of ideologies. But also he seems extremely focused on people who have a, an anarchist um, orientation, which, which, is, which is very different. Um, and of course, anarchistic traditions are 
um, about self-organisation, <laughs> they are about uh, communal decision making, they're about collective empowerment in that in that sort of broader sense. So I'm, I'm certain that that is, you know, part of the sort of um, part of the categorisation that's going on with um, Extinction Rebellion in this context. But it's certainly in terms of thinking, the work of thinking and trying to pave the way for a direction of travel politically, for me, taking it from the reality of things that occur to the imposition of what you think really is, um, you know, you can see directly where that can lead you in the direction of, well, maybe people can commit thought crimes. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you can attack people on the grounds of their association with certain individuals, who you've been seen with, where you've been, all of that kind of stuff. So it has a, I don't doubt that strategically underneath it, you know, they, that there's been a great amount of consideration to the sort of scope that you can get out of, out of work that sort of crowbars open these spaces, which I would say so far in this country haven't been, you know, they've not been available for the state to say, yeah. well, you know, we think you might have read some Kropotkin, so therefore we're going to bang you up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's deeply, deeply dystopian, isn't it? You know, we were, we thought the, the clamp down on our civil liberties and our, our right to protest was bad enough, but when mm. it comes down to um, to this sort of thing, it, it's deeply worrying. And it, it just shows the lengths that governments are prepared to go to to avoid dealing with the problem yeah. like you know clearly as as messengers we're not going to shut up as the problem worsens and worsens and worsens there are just going to be more and more people yeah. clamoring for action so the idea that the appropriate response is to prevent people from complaining about inaction rather than doing what needs to be done is, is, is yeah, it's, it's weird and worrying. The other thing that sort of ties everything together in a sort of global sense, and I know we've talked before about this Atlas think tank network and how a lot of strategies are now shared globally in terms of how to clamp down on successful protest movements and nonviolent um, actions and stuff. There's, um, you know, last generation in Germany um, were declared as a, um, criminal organization or whatever you know the the declaration that a non-violent protest group is organized crime was also attempted in this country by Priti Patel that was her line organized crime organized criminals which is bollocks because we don't fit the criteria for organized crime but it's also um, you know flies in the face of what was launched on the same day a while back as the new work from Walney, which was um, that the High Court decided that the new government regulations about limits um, to uh, disruption to the threshold of what can be called serious, that those limits that they'd put in were found to be unlawful. So you had, at the same moment, you had somebody saying, well, I think we should create a new categorization for non-violent people. So you can basically say they're terrorists, even though they're not, but we'll make a non-violent version of it so we can prescribe those organizations, which will stop them fundraising, stop them going on the news, limit their organizational um, abilities to like even meet and do things. But at the same time, our legislation is actually illegal. And that's, on the, and that's, and that's all over the BBC website. So I mean, it's, it's also, yeah, it's just very difficult to um, orientate yourself in this kind of environment, I guess. But um, these, are the, these are the times that we live in. It's worrying when the government's actions are constantly, you know, teetering at the edge of legality or going beyond the edge of, mm. of, of legality. Um, you know, it, 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 it's activists and, and demonstrators that are labelled as the extremists, but when we look at efforts that the government are going to to prevent people from raising their voices, it's hard not to think of them as the extremists here. Yeah, quite. So let's move on then to this, um, the nature and climate costs. There's three pieces of research that you've wanted to highlight. 
which look at this kind of economic cost frame of climate change, climate breakdown. It says here uh, there's a Nature paper in April um, about the committed economic costs of climate change. What does that mean, e committed economic costs, and what's that piece of work? Well, it means the costs that we can't avoid because these are damages that climate change is definitely going to cause now, regardless of what action we take. The, all this work on the economic costs of climate change is really important because people that argue against climate action, you know, governments and right-wing media and others that want to delay climate action, they always say taking action will be expensive. Mm -hmm. And it will be expensive. It, it, of course it will. We've got to decarbonize the entire economy. But when they say it'll be too expensive, that's sort of assuming that the cost of not taking action is, is zero. It's so it's, it's more expensive than doing nothing. What they don't say is that actually doing nothing will be hugely, hugely expensive. And that's what this new research shows. So this piece in Nature, um, so Nature's the, you know, one of the two biggest science journals globally. Um, and it, it, it came out a couple of months ago and it calculated that the committed economic costs of climate change by 2050 are 30 trillion dollars a year. Not 30 billion, but 30 trillion, sorry, 30 trillion pounds, right. 38 trillion dollars. Okay. Which is six times more than <clears throat> the five trillion pounds it will cost to decarbonize. And these, so these estimates are much, much, yeah, significantly higher than previous estimates because it's much more sophisticated research. It's used a lot more data. So previous estimates about the cost of climate change had just focused on the, the costs of temperature rises. This, this piece of research also includes the costs of um, rainfall and it includes the cost of certain other extreme weather events. Um, but it doesn't include all the costs. So it doesn't include the costs of sea level rise. It doesn't include the costs. Quite an oversight. It's a massive <laughs> one. Rise. It's a massive one. And it's, I mean, you say, you, you, you say oversight. It's, I, I mean, they're aware of these costs. It's just the, the research becomes yeah, really, really cumbersome when you're including all that data. So, so they, they chose not to, not, not to include that. But it doesn't include the costs of cyclones. It doesn't include the costs of um, damage to nature as a result of climate change. It doesn't include the costs of, of human health as a result of climate change. So it's really, really conservative. And the authors mm -hmm. say this in the paper. They say this is a conservative, lower, lower bound estimate. And yet, it's 30 trillion pounds per year globally, which is really extraordinary. So, so that's, that basically, we're gonna be paying those costs. Damages is probably a, a better word than costs, but we're gonna be paying those um, by 2050 regardless, because we're committed to that amount of climate change. But then the analysis went further and it looked at the costs of, of, of inaction towards the end of the century. Now, um, by 2050, so that $30 trillion is, is a 19% reduction in global incomes. Like one-fifth of global income will be, will be lost because of damages. And, and, and that's not spread evenly across the world. So um, in Europe and North America, it'll be about 11%. In Africa and South Asia, it'll be 22%. And some countries, particularly countries with countries in really hot places, will have yeah, even greater reductions in, in income. So Botswana and Mali will both lose 25%, Iraq 30%, um, Qatar 31%. So hot places are, are particularly vulnerable. So that's committed costs by 2050. Looking beyond 2050 to the end of the century, if we continue with business as usual, those costs will rise to 60% of global income. So nearly two thirds of global income will just be lost. Mm. If, on the other hand, we rapidly decarbonize, they think we could stabilize losses at about the 20% they will be by 2050. So it's a, you know, action that we take now and 
over you know, the next few years will make the difference between a 20% reduction in global wealth at the end of the century and a 60% reduction. So mm. it's massively, massively important. And, yeah. and it just completely you know, un- belies the lie that taking no action is the cheapest thing, it's the economically sensible thing to do. So the second piece of research was a working paper from the National Bureau of, of Economic Research, which is a research organization in the US. They came up with, they used a different methodology, but they found that um, for every one degree rise in temperature, that will cost 12% of um, GDP, uh, of, of, of gross domestic product. So just to be clear, that sounds like it's in relatively uh, speaking, it's in some broad agreement with the piece of research you were just talking about. Yeah, in terms of multiple analyses from different institutions or different spaces coming to kind of the same, relatively the same absolutely. space. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult to compare because they use different methodologies and they're, they're sort of making their calculations in, in sort of different units. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they're converging on this this same idea. And the, the key finding of, of this report was that, so, so previous analyses had suggested um, that it would be you know, six times lower. And if we took the previous analyses at, at face value, then it was possible to argue that decarbonisation wasn't the most cost-effective thing to do. But this analysis says very, very clearly the most sensible, the cheapest, the most economically wise thing to do is to decarbonise as quickly as we can. Mm-hmm. And, and it was you know, very, very clear in, in, in reaching that conclusion. When there was that work by um, Nordhaus that said, you know, it would be better to just warm the planet by three degrees because it would be somehow better for the economy. And Steve Keen has worked quite relentlessly to highlight the fact that that presupposed that um, most economic activity occurs indoors and therefore will be unaffected by things that happen out there in the weather, which also felt like actually the economics was developed by some uh, thinking that didn't actually really know the difference between what you might call the climate system, what you might call weather uh, outside. It's unbelievable, isn't it, that there's still such a sort of um, rigid attachment to the notion that firstly GDP is the most important thing in the world and that growth is the most important thing in the world and we must um, analyse things on that basis. And we must prioritise that as well, like one of the most important things. But also, um, I guess, you know, there's a question for me about the usefulness of this kind of analysis being that you can enter the sort of mainstream political discourse because that's what it's about. It's always about money. At the same time, as I think we have to hold very um, close to the criticism of that as a frame at all or you know as that as the sort of primary lens because obviously when you put an economic value on every single facet of the living world that you think you can categorize and then you shove it all in a spreadsheet and say well we can do that but not this and we you know this is the balance sheet it's not doesn't really work like that does it yeah and that i i agree and it it makes me really uncomfortable in a lot of ways to be, you know, just talking about these impacts in 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 dollar figures because, yeah, what we're talking about is mass suffering and death. What we're talking about is the loss of people's homes. What we're talking about is the loss of people's sense of identity as they're driven away from the places that where um, where they've lived their whole lives. We're talking about, you know, the the extinction of species and disappearance of the places we love. So. We're talking about things that are, are, you know, so much bigger and more fundamental than the economy. Mm. But ultimately, this is the language that decision makers use, and I think so. So it is useful to to translate these impacts into a language that 
decision makers understand. Yeah. Um, and and certainly, you know, while, while, whilst in a way, you know, the economy is all, 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 all abstract and, 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 and things, it, it does have you know, real world impacts on, on real world people when the economy um you know contracts it's the poor in society it's the vulnerable in society that suffer most it's you know when when we had the the global economic crisis in in 2008 the political response to that was austerity and we've had yeah. you, you know the so the the impacts of the 2008 crisis are playing out in the cost of living crisis that we're having now in the UK you, you know 16 years later so it does have real world um, impacts and you know, so one of the things that, that that was interesting about the the analysis in nature was that it highlighted the inequality involved as a result of these you know, the, the, these financial hits and contraction of uh, you know, reductions in income will only be 11% in Europe, but there'll be 25% in Botswana and, and, and Mali. Yeah. These are vulnerable countries, are vulnerable because of their, you know, their geographic position in the world. They're, they're hot and, and vulnerable to extreme weather, but they're also vulnerable because of their, their poverty. They lack capacity to to adapt. So I think, um, although, although economics is a crude language, um, it is a useful language in that it, you know, it, it can be used to, to sort of describe real world problems. Mm. And so in terms of the costs, let's say, I mean, it sounds ludicrous to me, you have a projection that says by the end of the century, we could be um, global economic system could be getting hit with 60% costs, um, damages. I mean, to me, that sounds like civilization that has broken down completely. <laughs> because well, from where we are now to there, it's not like there's just going to be less money around and people have got to spend lots of money fixing things. It sounds like that's completely uh, catastrophic. Um, and also that it's totally unevenly distributed um, and that it's likely to be an underestimation because we know that the complexity of these things and the non-linearity of what can happen in the climate system and in ecosystems means that things can be far worse far more quickly than anyone can actually predict based on data that the scientific community are happy to sort of stand next to. So. Can you talk about the third piece of research, which is about this nature loss, the value of nature loss, or I think loss is an unfortunate word because it's not being lost, it's being fucking destroyed. Yeah. But the, the, the cost of destroying nature biodiversity, another paper that says that, presumably if that projection is 12% in the UK, then there's also a projected global loss based on that as well. And you just said that that's not included in those original first two reports that we talked about. So with the limitations of those, and then the application of this thinking that looks at how we're just destroying life in a big sense of the word, really, surely that when you look at these three pieces of research together, it, it says that the activists are right. <laughs> and that the arguments against us are completely baseless, but can you can you talk about the, the, the nature part? Yeah, so this third piece of research was just looking at the UK and rather than looking at the, the costs of climate change, it was looking at the costs of destroying nature. So um, loss of biodiversity, loss of soils, um, pollution of our wetlands and things like this. And it estimated that if if current trends continue as they are, then it could cost 12% of UK's GDP by 2030. Not by 2050, but you know, by, by 2030. It's not very far uh, away. No, that's, that, that's six years. Um, but, but you're absolutely right, because these different pieces of research look at isolated systems and they don't look at how those systems are interacting. So you've got some, some work saying climate change is going to cost this, other work saying um, 
you know, destruction of nature is going to co cost this. But the destruction of nature and climate change are interacting systems. Climate change is going to worsen the destruction of nature. The destruction of nature is going to worsen climate change. And we, there's, there just isn't any modeling that brings these things together. The other way in which the, the modeling is really lacking is, as you say, it sort of, it looks as, it looks at how the particular system you're looking at will change through time, but it, it sort of has to assume that everything else remains constant at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, like a paper that's saying, well, yeah, there'll be 60% decreases in, in income by 2100 is assuming that the society hasn't collapsed entirely by 2100. It's assuming that, you know, our, our food production systems haven't collapsed entirely. But these things are non-linear, as you say, and we simply don't know if that will be the case. So, in, in a, you know, whilst it's very important to, to understand that if all else stays the same, climate change will reduce incomes by 60% by the end of the century. It's also a bit of a nonsensical figure because everything might have collapsed by then. And, yeah. you know, we, we, might not, we might not have an economy with, with yeah, we'll still, have, we'll still have economic activity, of course, but it might not be a formal economy where, where trade flows can actually be measured, where, you, you know, the, the very concept of a yeah. gross domestic product might be this quaint, ancient notion by, by the end of this century. Yeah. Well, and also it speaks to a concept somebody spoke to me about recently um, that they're studying, which is called derailment risk. And... What they mean by that is, this is a person who like studies tipping points, cascade risk, compound impacts from the climate crisis. So like you say, how does that affect that, affect that, affect that, and then bang, it's like too many things and it's too much force and things tip or things move extremely quickly. He's interested from having done a whole load of research in that field in looking at this concept of derailment risk, which basically means the point at which society becomes unable to do the things that it needs to do, like an energy transition, for example, because it's simply l dealing with too much chaos. So you're so distracted by things that are broken, by extreme weather, by destruction, by people being displaced, by polit all of the problems that can come from this sort of myriad of impacts when they reach a sort of fever pitch, if you like, of, of, of enough, uh, the political eyes will be just elsewhere. And there's no possibility then to focus on decarbonisation of anything or the transition of anything that we need to do because you're just dealing with, like, a shit show, basically. So I guess I will talk more about that in a future episode because I, you know, I'm going to be sort of tuning into that work and trying to understand you know, what, what that's really looking at. But for, in terms of being able to sort of explain that politically or think about how you speak to people who work in politics or work in some kind of position of sort of power and stewardship of money or resources or the world, um, it strikes me as extremely important to make them aware that their work is going to become completely untenable because they actually just won't be able to concentrate on the things that need to be done because there'll be too many other pressing things and you know it, it's super important to communicate that because because everybody's world view everybody's conceptions of the future are based on how the past has been up till now it's the only thing we have to 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 go on really is, is our past experience but what we know about climate change and these cascading um, and interacting risks is that the future will be nothing like what the past has been up to now. And yet, everybody in, in, you know, involved in planning, in governments, in, in every industry, is just basing their future plans on the idea that everything's going to be the same in the future. And it, mm. it's just not. So, let's move on then to this related topic, Restore Nature Now March, which is happening on June the 22nd. Extinction Rebellion has managed to do another kind of big 
convening job, if you like, a bit like the, the big one in terms of pulling in bigger groups, NGOs, other organisations that don't normally come and block the streets with us or do whatever. The RSPB, National Trusts, I presume that means branches of the National Trusts and the Wildlife Trusts, different scientific organisations. I mean, I think it's very interesting because the nature crisis or the concept of restoring nature is highly salient as a campaign tool for people who are not naturally part of where a lot of our Extinction Rebellion's base might be um, in terms of seeing themselves as rebels or something you would invite some more conservative-minded people into a discussion about restoring nature and there'd be much agreement, I'm sure. So it's, you know, I think it's politically and um, culturally interesting because it's a, it's a unifying thing to get people to act on. But it's also um, timely, isn't it? Because there's just been this big letter from scientists to the leaders of political parties to sort of, I don't know if demand is the right word, but to, you know, put pressure to say what exactly? So this is a letter that's been signed by 180 scientists that's gone to our political leaders to, to point out, you know, the, the massive failings in, in UK's nature policies. And these have been worsened um, in a big way over the last few years by by our current government, it's been it's been branded an attack on on nature, um, and it's been really worrying because over you know over the decades, environmental organisations working with government and pressure on government have have managed to to get nature protection laws put in place. Like it's been massively inadequate, but we have had some legislation protecting nature. What's been happening over recent years is the government trying to undo mm -hmm. the existing legislation. So it's not just carrying on making things worse, but actually reversing the environmental wins that we've had in the past. And there's been a massive, you know, multifaceted attack on nature. One of the biggest components of this came from um, what was called the EU Reform Bill. So many of our um, environmental laws date from the period when we were part of the European Union. And they are, so we, were, we, we didn't have domestic legislation in place. What protected nature in this country was European legislation. Mm. What this government said um, after Brexit was that a whole bunch of environmental laws, EU environmental laws, would not be replaced by domestic legislation. So as of January 1st this year, they just stopped applying, but there are no equivalent laws yeah. in, the, in their stead. Um, on top of that, they've done a whole bunch of other things. So they tried to um, weaken laws on, on pollution into rivers in favor of housing developers. They've um, passed a loophole allowing farmers to dump manure into rivers. They've just completely allowed the water companies to get away with doing, you, you know, just yeah. the most awful shit to our, to our rivers and seas. They are setting up free ports and investment zones and you know, massive great areas of the country where they will say environmental and social protections don't apply here because this is a free port, this is, this is to maximise you know, economic mm. development and, and nothing else matters. They've, they've been talking about shifting the responsibility for creating um, sites of special scientific interest, so legally protected areas, shifting the responsibility for doing that from Natural England, um, which is you know, a, a regulatory body, to DEFRA, the Minister of the Environment. So bring bring the power to create and uncreate protected areas into the government instead of um, letting Natural England do it. They've completely slashed funding for the Environment Agency and the Environment Agency are responsible for, for implementing, yeah, enforcing most of our na nature laws. And by, by slashing their budgets, they've, they've taken away all their enforcement capacity. So that, and they've been yeah, really clear about this. It, it's sort of like it's a green light for 
anyone that wants to pollute because everybody knows yeah, the environment police essentially are not there. No one yeah. is going to stop you because they don't have the, the budget. So there's been this massive attack on nature and all the, the, the conservation, um, the civil society conservation groups in this country, like, like the uh, Royal Society for Protection of Birds and Wildlife Trusts and others, they've been calling out the government online for a good year, maybe a year and a half. They've been tweeting and saying, we can't stand for this, this is not enough. You, you, you know, you, you, you guys are doing terrible things. We will, we will you know, mobilize our, our membership to stop you. But they haven't actually done that until now. And, and so, yeah, on, on 22nd of June, there's going to be this enormous gathering of, of nature lovers from, from around the country. It, it might be um, yeah, the biggest gathering there's ever been for, for nature in this country. And personally, it's, you know, as, as a conservationist, it, it's like, it, it's a moment I've always dreamed of. I've always, you know, felt, I've always found it so strange that everybody in this country, we pride ourselves on being a nation of, of, of nature lovers. Whenever I, I tell people about the work I used to do, you know, conserving endangered species in Mauritius or protecting forests in Madagascar, people always say that's, that's such a wonderful thing. It's so important that we do what we can to conserve tropical biodiversity. And yet when it comes to our own nature in our own country, people just don't seem to to, to, to be prepared to, to do much about it. Sure, like people will give their money, they'll, you know, they'll donate their three quid a month to, to this organization and that organization. But there's sort of just been this, this tacit idea that, you know, standing up for nature is not for me. I leave it to the professionals. I give my money to the OSPB yeah. and they stand up for nature on my behalf. And, and up till now, the, the strategy of all these organizations has been one of politely asking the government to do the right thing. And I think this now actually marks like a, a, a change by mobilizing their membership out onto the streets. I think it, it feels to me like a really significant shift in strategy from, from politely asking the government to actually starting to, to to think about this more as, as in, in terms of power and yeah, more standing in the way of the government, actually coming out to say, no, we will not accept this. And, and I think that's a really, really important step for these organizations to be taking. And, I, and I'm really excited that they, they are taking it. I think, I think it takes a lot of courage to, to do. You know, lots of these are, are membership based organizations and you know perhaps not all of their members will be happy about stepping out on, onto the streets in, in protest as you say um, you know love of nature is something that that's apolitical and and you know is widespread right across the, the political spectrum and there are many you know, right-leaning conservative people that, that do pay their membership to to these organizations every month so stepping out in this way isn't without risks mm. they also i think risk losing or they risk jeopardizing somewhat their their, their insider status you know organizations like the rspb and national trust are sort of quite powerful lobbying forces and they have their sort of inside track to 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 meet with ministers and 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 and, and lobby them now they're recognizing that that hasn't worked and that you know perhaps the best thing to do to make their voices heard is to actually step out onto the streets so i think it's you know it's it's a really significant shift in strategy for them but it's also a really it, it's quite a ringing endorsement of of collective action and and direct action as, as well you know these organizations have said we have done our utmost to try and make progress through the formal channels that are available to us and we tried to play by the rules and do you know take action in the socially appropriate way for decades it's not working we now recognize it's not working we're now calling on the people power of our membership and we're going to take action not as an organization but as a social movement and i think that's really something as well yeah and it's, you know, it's also, I met somebody from the RSPB and they told me about 
the origins of it, which I didn't realise, was like basically women who kicked off. <laughs> that was their description to me. It was like the people who founded this organisation were kind of like the suffragettes. You know, they were like they're quite radical-minded, um, and they were ready to go out and be disruptive and cause a fuss and force people to pay attention. Um, so it's also true that like baked into the sort of backstory of quite a lot of these organisations is a longer tradition that you know, recognises and connects and um, engages with, you know, civil disobedience, non-violent direct action, all sorts of um, different things. And I think precisely, you know, the conversations I've had over the years with people in the third sector about not being associated with Extinction Rebellion has always come to this sort of line, which I can't bear to hear over and over again. Well, our base is conservative with a small c and we're worried about our donations so therefore blah 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 but at the same time we've like many of them poll their membership and say you know oh one third of them or something would go on a march just they're not offering them to yeah. go and march down the streets and it's hardly um despite the sort of um shifting legal landscape in this country it's hardly a radical thing in my view, to march just, in the name of something. March. It's just a very ordinary um, thing to do. So I hope everybody's going to go and attend that. Where's the June the 22nd uh, Restore Nature Now march? And um, hopefully they'll see you there, Charlie. Yeah, I hope so. I'll be there. I'm really looking forward to it. I might be speaking as well. Um, there are over 150 organisations that are officially taking part in this. So if you're a member of any conservation charities, you'll probably have received an email from them already with details about how their members are joining. But otherwise, look at uh, RestoreNatureNow.com and the convening point is Park Lane at 12 o'clock on the 22nd. So it's going to be a great day. It's going to be part of history. Biggest event for nature ever in this country. It'll be a wonderful atmosphere, wonderful vibe. And yeah, look forward to seeing you there.